Good morning, church. It is good to see all of your faces today, or what I can see of them. Um, and it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, we are, um, yeah, I don't know. This week was crazy. And um, it is good to be here together to set our focus and our mind on Christ, to not be looking at the world and the things that are going on there, but to know that God has us in his very hand. And I hope you will walk away today uh, encouraged and, um, and not in despair and not in fear, but um, knowing that God uh, is in control. Uh, we do not have a lot of announcements today. Just a reminder that this week uh, the youth activities are starting on Wednesday night. We're going to have them like we did in the fall. Um, the only change right now is for the youth banding program where uh, only youth band will be meeting. Uh, beginners and intermediate will be starting in a couple of weeks. So um, that is the only change for that. And just a reminder for core council that we'll be meeting on the 25th this month. Let us go to the uh, Lord in prayer. Father God, we have gathered to worship you, to worship you for your love, for your kindness, for your goodness, for your sovereignty. We know, Lord, that you have this world in your hands. Teach us to trust you. You have proven faithful. Help us to remember your faithfulness. Father God, I just pray that your Holy Spirit will come upon us mightily. For your word promises that you have not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of self-control. Give us now open hearts to receive your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to echo Rochelle's good morning and ask you to stand and join me as we praise the one who has saved our soul. So join us as we sing. Robes of 
praise today because of what the Son has done, how he died for our sins and rose again. And he did that because the Father loved us so very much. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring sons to glory behold the man upon the cross my sin upon his shoulders ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the As Rochelle was talking about, and we all know, this has been an interesting and chaotic week. If you want to be seated, that's fine. And it's interesting. We've watched lots of footage, I'm sure you have. We've seen lots of pictures. And it's hard to know how to respond. And it's just we're grieving for our country. Um, I shared in prayer meeting this morning that on December 31st, Olivia and I had a conversation. She said, okay, Mom, so tomorrow everything's going to be back to normal. No, it's not. And so we, had, we, we talked about that, that this, it doesn't just change just like that, because there is sin in this world, and so there will be elements of chaos, but the Lord says, fear not, for I have overcome the world. I have overcome all of this, and I will for each and every one of you. And so today, and I, I shared this in prayer meeting, for us as a people of faith, for us here today, for you watching at home, what is our response? Because we are a very unique, diverse people, and it's not just our backgrounds or our ages, um, it's our thinking and our feeling. And we have different perspectives on what has happened, and we have different thoughts. And it's easy during this time to react instead of respond, right? To, to just immediately do the gut check uh, and react. And I've been praying this week, and I'm going to ask you to pray today, that we as a people of faith focus on the Lord. And that when we respond, we are responding with his light and with his love. This is a beautiful opportunity for us to show a hurting world 
what Christ looks like. And so I think about this passage in Colossians, I go to it a lot, I need to be remembering it a lot as garments that we need to pick up. It's in Colossians 3 and it starts in verse 12. Think about your teenager's room, right, with all of the clothes everywhere. And, and you go in and you pick up a piece after a piece. Well, think about walking in and picking up each one of these and actually putting them on. This morning, this scripture says this, therefore as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion. Clothe yourself with kindness, put on humility, put on gentleness, button up patience, bear with each other and forgive one another if, you have any, if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. The perfect answer for right now has got to be love. Our response to right now has got to be love. Amen? That's what it has to be. That's the only answer we have. And I'm thinking about social media and the responses from so many people. I don't know if they're always grounded in love. Because love says, I don't have to be first. I don't have to win the argument. I don't have to be right all the time. I don't have to have the last word. Love listens, love hopes, love seeks to understand, and love can prevail in beautiful and profound ways if we allow it to, if we clothe ourselves. And so today we need to be praying for our country for safety and for rational thought, but we also need to be praying for us as a people of faith that we can show that profound love in very clear and active ways because when we're putting on all of those garments, what we're really doing is putting on Christ completely, putting him on. And I think about Facebook and I think about Twitter and I think about Instagram and all these places that we can post. And then I think about all of those middle school kids and high school kids and college age kids that are also on there and they're seeing what these adults of faith that they associate are people of faith are saying and that might be what they think Jesus is saying. So do we look at it with that element when we respond? Are we helping to shape their understanding even in this crazy time are we helping them shape their understanding of God's love, of who Jesus Christ really is? So we need to be praying for that today. I know people are hurting. I know we're grieving. I know people are angry. Those are all real feelings, but they don't define us. Only Jesus Christ defines us, and his love defines us. Won't you pray with me this morning? Lord, this has been an overwhelming week. It's been an overwhelming year, and this week just kind of kept it going. And we know that that is something we should expect. We should expect trials in this world because it is not perfect as you had desired it to be, but it will, and we can gather and still live in your kingdom today. But Lord, let us live as kingdom people. Kingdom people who put on compassion, who put on patience, who put on forgiveness and kindness and humility and gentleness. People who are, even though we think differently, we might disagree, we can still be united in faith as we claim you as our Lord and Savior. Help us to gather around each one of us as much of your love as possible. Lord, we are weary we are tired, but your Holy Spirit can provide exactly what we need, what this world needs right now. Lord, help us turn our eyes to you. In your name, amen. In a moment, the band's going to play Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, and I think we know the chorus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim. This week will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. But listen to this verse. O soul, are you wearied and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. And the last verse says, his word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. 
then go to a world that is dying his perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. So we're going to be looking at uh, John 11 today. If you want to have your Bibles open there. We're basically going to be walking through the first uh, 44 verses. <laughs> Don't worry, it sounds... Worse than it really is. But again, we're looking at John 11 today. And uh, as, we, as we walk through this together this morning, um, I want to start just by saying this. Uh, sickness and death, which are very real things for all of us, were never meant to be part of God's plan for us. We know it's painful when we experience the loss of people we love. We've done that recently. And despite its inevitability, we all live hoping to avoid it. Sometimes the loss is so overwhelming, it can feel like we might not make it through the pain. And it can be one of the hardest things to deal with as human beings. Obviously, because of that difficulty, we don't always understand why God's plans work the way they do. The disciples, even as they were living face-to-face -face with Jesus, also had a hard time understanding a lot of that stuff. So if you feel today like there's a lot that you don't understand, give yourself a little bit of grace, because the men that were walking with him day by day were so clueless half the time, that's really all of us. Now, we sometimes think of those disciples as being superhuman, but they weren't, right? As we examine Scripture, we can see it wasn't the case. They failed often, and Jesus never gives up on them. He knew the importance of strengthening their faith, and he knew he was going to have to leave them, and that their ministry was going to continue. And he knew that he had to do everything he could to prepare them for that. Now, today's passage is an important step in that growth, not only for the disciples as they see what takes place here, but for us as well. Now, when the events take place, Jesus is about 20 miles away from Bethany, where Lazarus was with Mary and Martha. After the messenger comes and goes, Jesus then waits two more days before leaving to go to Bethany. And by the time he and his disciples arrive, Lazarus has been dead for four days. It means Lazarus had died the very day that the messenger leaves to bring the message to Jesus. And if we allow for travel to take one day each way, 
just so that you have this in your mind as we walk through this, the travel looks like this. Day one, the messenger comes to Jesus, and on that day, Lazarus dies. Day two, the messenger returns back to Bethany. Day three is when Jesus waits another day, and then he departs, and on day four, that's when he arrives. So this is a four-day time period, and that's really important. We'll get to that later, but there's a, there's a really um, specific reason for those four days. Now, as I read this, you, you have to feel a little bit for the messenger, right? Because he would arrive back home, and Lazarus is already dead. He had to be nervous, knowing that the message of, uh, he'll be coming, probably wasn't a lot of comfort. What he didn't realize was that Jesus was urging the people there to believe his word no matter how discouraging the circumstances might be. No doubt the disciples were confused about several things. They didn't even understand his reference to being asleep. It's, it's funny, that's, that seems to be one of those things that every time Jesus says it, the disciples always seem to think he's talking about actual sleep, and he usually never is. They never get it, and they didn't get it here. And yet their questioning does make sense. First of all, if Jesus loved Lazarus so much, then why did he allow for him to get sick? And the quick answer to that is, he didn't. Sickness is just one of the many byproducts of the sin in our world, meaning we are not afflicted with sin as a punishment. We are not afflicted with sickness as a punishment for sin. It's simply one of the flaws and imperfections we brought upon ourselves when the fall occurred and sin entered the world. Once that took place and we found ourselves outside of the garden and its perfection, sin and all that comes with it is part of our lives. Second, why did he delay his arrival? We know he could have healed Lazarus where he was. He could have thought something, he could have said something, and it would have been done. The record makes it clear that there was a strong love relationship between Jesus and this family. Yet his actions caused confusion and could have even seemed to contradict that relationship and that love. And the answer here is a little bit more complicated as to why that is. We have to remember the following this morning, and this is a hard one. God's love for his own people is not always meant to comfort in kindness. And what I mean by that is, sometimes his love is meant to perfect. The fact that he loves us and that we love him is not a guarantee that we will be sheltered from the problems of this life. I wish that wasn't the case. I think we all do. And yet we know it's not that kind of promise. And in fact, the strongest example we have of that is seen in the sacrifice of Jesus. So think about it this way. God loved his son with the greatest love imaginable. Love we cannot even comprehend in our human minds. And yet the father permitted his son to experience the shame and pain of the cross. We make a mistake when we think that love and suffering are incompatible. The truth is that they unite in Jesus Christ. So looking at, starting with verse 17, it says this, Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Now, John's narrative here is culturally significant. This is the four-day thing that I mentioned earlier. 
It was a well-known Jewish belief. Now, this is not accurate, but it was a Jewish belief of the time. And the belief was that the soul of a person would remain in the vicinity of the body, hoping to re-enter it for three days. It's what they believed. But once decomposition sets in, it departs. Why that matters is that John and Jesus are making it clear that Lazarus was dead. They wanted the effect of the miracle, Jesus wanted the effect of the miracle, to be very clear. It wasn't a simple resuscitation. There was no, there was no quick fix here to something that really wasn't that bad. Lazarus was gone. Jesus could have prevented his sickness or healed him, and he chose not to. There's nothing he cannot do, but he saw in this sickness an opportunity to show God's glory. And more than that, his timing was another example of him doing all things in obedience and accordance to the will of his Father. It wasn't a situation to make people feel good or to feel comfortable, but it was important that people saw and experienced God's glory. And the final result of this event, this event would be that God was glorified, not that death would have the victory. Yet it wasn't a denial of Lazarus' death. It was confirmation that death would not have the final word. Jesus wanted Mary and Martha, along with everyone else, to lay hold of that promise. When we find ourselves confronted by disease, disappointment, delay, even death. We can find encouragement in the word of God and it comes down to living by faith and not by sight. This story is an example of all of that. All of those things I just mentioned, disease, disappointment, delay, and even death, all those things were taking place in this event. Now each experience of suffering and trial should increase our faith. I think we know that, that in theory, that's how it's supposed to work. The reality, though, is that it's not automatic. We have a choice in how we respond to the things that happen in our lives. The ministry of the Word, the Spirit of God, all the things that come at us as far as our faith, and all the things that are intertwined in how life looks for us give us a choice. Jesus sent a promise to the two sisters and then would discover how they had received it. He was doing the same thing with them that he does with us today. He was giving them a choice. As they respond, it is clear that they do not fully understand what is happening. And yet they still believe that Jesus could do anything. In verse 22, Martha was quick to affirm her faith in Jesus Christ. And he responds to that faith by promising that her brother would rise again. Now he's thinking of the immediate situation. She interprets his words a little differently. She thinks he means the future resurrection in the last day. So in a sense, she's on the right track. And she's believing his power, but she doesn't quite get that he means right now. Even though she misunderstood what he said, note that Jesus does not deny what she said about the future. In his I Am statement, he completely transforms the doctrine of the resurrection and in so doing brought great comfort to Martha. And he does that here. Verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Through his teaching, through his miracles, and his own resurrection, clearly Jesus taught the resurrection of the human body. He declared that death is real, that there is life after death, 
and that the body will one day be raised by the power of God. He transformed this doctrine in a second way, though, that's a little bit more important. He is taking this doctrine out of a book and he's putting it into a person in himself. Now, it would be profound on its own if Jesus was able to say, I can provide resurrection. I can provide life. If someone is able to say that, if Jesus is able to say that, there is real power in those words, and that would be great. That in itself would probably even be enough. But it goes so much deeper than that. He is telling us he is the resurrection and he is life. In other words, eternal life and rescue from the finality of death are not just gifts we receive. They are aspects of what it means to live a life in Christ. More than simple doctrine, it is the reality that we are saved by a Redeemer in Him. Now, this is what we forget. We don't have to wait until the end of human time and history and for all the events of this world to finish before we experience that. We can enjoy the power of Jesus as we live a life in him right now, today. All we have to do is honor him by the way we live, obey him in the way we live, and follow his will. And if we're doing that, when we know him by faith, we no longer have to fear the shadow of death. One of the greatest transformations Jesus performed was moving the doctrine of the resurrection out of the future and into the present. It is present here today. Now Martha was looking to the future knowing that Lazarus would rise again at some point. Her friends were looking to the past and saying, he could have prevented this. Why didn't he? And Jesus was acting to turn their focus to the present. Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Wherever we find ourselves, God's resurrection power is available now. Now, I want you to hear this because we often struggle with this reality. If we only look to the future with a mindset that we just want him to return because the world's a mess and we're done with it and we just want him to get here, it means we are missing the blessings of this life. In the same way, if we cannot stop looking to the past with the mindset that we've done something that we can't be forgiven for, that the mistakes we've made, the things that have happened, are so bad or to a degree that we cannot be redeemed, then we are held prisoner by our past and we are missing the blessings of this life. So whether we're looking forward or backwards, God is expecting that we live in the here and now and realize his power is available today. His claim of being the resurrection in life means that he is the source of both. There's no resurrection apart from him. There's no eternal life apart from him. And beyond that, his divine nature equates to doing more than giving life. He is life and death has no ultimate power over him. 1 John 5, starting with verse 10, says this, Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar, because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. And this is the testimony, that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have 
life. If we believe in him, we will share in his triumph over death. And we will experience resurrection because life in Jesus means it is impossible for death to defeat us. So back to John 11, verse 32. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could, he not, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? This is another really important aspect to this story. And we see the mystery of the incarnation in his question from verse 34. And some of this stuff, I don't know if you've thought of all of this, and I have, some of this I have, some of this as I walked through this, um, preparing for this sermon, um, I, I was noticing things were hitting me in different ways. I, w- I was actually really um, paying attention to some specific details that maybe hadn't hit me this way before. But think about verse 34. Jesus knew that Lazarus had died, but he asked where he was buried. It's important because this is the evidence that he was truly and properly God and truly and properly man. In other words, he wasn't using divine powers when his man-made abilities were were enough. Again, he wasn't a magician. So in that very moment, he's asking where he's buried because he didn't know. We know that Jesus weeps, and it's a profound moment in his ministry. And it would make sense that we ask why he wept at all. Because he knew Lazarus was going to be okay. So why? Why is that? Now the answer essentially has two parts, and it's a little bit more complex than you may realize. And part of it has to do with translation. So first, when it says Jesus was deeply moved, our English language really doesn't do that justice. Because the true meaning behind the Greek verb that was used is actually describing a situation made more of outrage, fury, anger, frustration. There's a little bit more to it. And that doesn't really make sense until we walk through why that is. Jesus was troubled. He was looking at the futility of the moment and was overcome. And most commentaries explain it this way. Because God's people possess knowledge of life, they should possess a faith that claims victory at the grave. But we don't always do that. He was standing in the midst of people who were overcome in seeming defeat. And his tears were tied to the frustration that he felt so deeply. He was seeing the hurt and the pain and all the ways in which sin had once again affected and messed things up. And it produced justified trouble in his heart. He's seeing people overcome totally distraught in the midst of him trying to defeat death and show them it doesn't have to be this way. But it wasn't just that. His weeping also reveals his humanity. He experienced these things in deeper ways than we can probably imagine. But what it tells us is he entered into our experience and he knows 
everything we feel. His tears assure us of his sympathy and help us to see how acquainted with our grief he actually is. It shows us that we can come to the throne of grace and find everything we need because he knows. Verse 38. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. This is another really important aspect of this story today, and it's this. Christ is dealing with the issue of death, and he does it in prayer. First, by his wording, we know that Jesus had already prayed for Lazarus. So in verse 41, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. In other words, the prayer has already taken place. It wasn't a last-minute ask, but a miracle that Jesus anticipated and one he knew would bring glory to God. Second, his prayer was audible, not in order to impress people, but so that the people around him could hear it and they could learn from his example. And third, he addresses God as Father, not as our Father, but as his Father. He is demonstrating that in all he does, he does in accordance with God's will. He's never acting on his own, but in obedience to God. This is the example we should be following. When circumstances occur in our lives, any circumstances at all, good or bad, whatever happens, we should be challenged to do the following. One, start with prayer. Always. I'm not good at that. I'm not. I'm good at calling someone and venting and losing my mind for a while, and then I'll pray about it. My wife deals with that quite often, but it's true. And yet, and I don't know if I've said this before, but I, I want you to think about it this way. How much more fair is it of me to my wife to pray about situations that are troubling me and to leave it with the Lord and deal with the crazy part so that then I can talk to her and do, it, do so in a rational way that actually makes a little bit more sense, where I'm a little bit more calmed down, I know that God is in control. Or is it better for me to just lose it, have her pick up the pieces and deal with that, and, and then think about how to pray through it. it. It makes no sense for that to be the way I do things, and yet I do it all the time. Always start with prayer. Second, always live out your prayer life in ways that can help others. Again, Jesus does not pray the way he prays here to impress people. He is doing it so that they know what is going on. Now, I'm not saying that you should stand at work and just all of a sudden, you know, in the middle of nothing, you just break out in prayer and hope people are listening and learn something from you. I'm not saying that. They'll think you're nuts. What I am saying to you is that you can live a life that shows that prayer is real. You can talk about prayer in ways 
that show that when you are praying, you believe it. And lastly, do everything in obedience to God and in accordance with his will. When we are doing that praying, when we are living out those prayers, we have to do it with the mindset that what God wants, even when we don't understand, is what needs to happen. If we are doing those things as we face all that life throws at us, it means that people are going to be drawn to Christ. It means that when I say that, they are going to have opportunities to experience the reality of resurrection and life in him. My prayer is that we individually live in such a way that not only honors Christ, but does so in a way that helps others to see this, to see the power of the resurrection and life that are only found in him. I know that the band is going to be uh, playing for the closing song. And before we get to that, I just want to share one last thought with you today. And this has really been on my heart, especially this week, just with, again, with everything that's been going on and everything that's taken place. Don't measure the love of God for you by the amount of good health and wealth and great things that are happening in your life. The comfort that we have and experience is not a direct reflection of Christ's love for us. And if you need to know a different way to have that make sense, if comfort was the measure of God's love, then he hated Paul. Think about it that way. And we know he didn't. He loved him. I want you to measure God's love for you by how much of himself he is showing to you. How much of himself he is giving you to enjoy in this life. And I think many of us can testify to that reality. I think we can do so with thankfulness and with joy in our hearts. And I want you to think about it this way, especially, again, with the heaviness of this week, How, however, that, however you're translating that. In the days of suffering and loss, in the days of darkness, and when it seems like nothing is going right. Jesus loved us, not first by taking away the suffering or the loss or the darkness, but first by giving us himself in ways that could not have been our experience without the painful part of the season we are in. If we demand that God loves us the way the world expects to be loved in this life, we're not going to know what it really means to be loved by God. The love of God is the gift of himself. And because he loved Lazarus and Mary and Martha, he stayed two days longer and let them walk through the valley of the shadow of death, not alone, but with him. And if we are realizing that suffering and love go hand in hand, then we are going to realize that nothing we face is on our own. Everything we, lo- everything we walk through in this life is something where we are shielded and protected and loved through it all by God himself.
today.